Um, first of all, um, let me uh, welcome you all at our today's ZEF public lecture. In this occasion, we would like to hear a presentation from Dr. Jacob Steiner under the title, Catchment Hydrology in High Mountain Asia, Process Understanding in Bridging Scales. Before the presentation begins, um, allow me to uh, briefly uh, introduce the today's presenter. Dr. Steiner holds an MSc in Environmental Engineering from uh, Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, he has a PhD from the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. He has a work experience um, with uh, Pakistan, uh, in Pakistan, in Nepal, China, Tajikistan, and the Arctic region for the last 15 years. Um, his main focus is on the high mountains and Arctic hydrology in the cryosphere. During his work at the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, or ICMOD, he has also been responsible for translating scientific findings into policy relevant output for regional uh, stakeholders. Without further delay, I would like to welcome Dr. Steiner to deliver his presentation. Um, kindly, the floor is yours, Dr. Uh, Steiner. Thank you, Fasul. I'm very happy to be here. I, well, unfortunately, only online or virtually, I would be very, very happy to give this talk in Bonn myself. Uh, I, I, I had, the, had the pleasure to travel to Bonn uh, um, a couple of times, or I got to know the city actually only just before, just before COVID, because a friend of mine uh, moved uh, back from Zurich uh, uh, to Bonn for work, to work at the Bundesnetzagentur. Um, so I have I've enjoyed the city uh, a lot. But right now I'm I'm in Lahore in Pakistan, um, where I had the, the, the pleasure to finally, after two years, give a university lecture in person again. Uh, the last two, three years I was teaching in the Netherlands at my alma mater. You can see the logo up there in the, in the corner. So I was at Utrecht University. But uh, yeah, the rules in the Netherlands were also quite strict. So all my lectures, I actually did, uh, I did them virtually and I still teach in the Netherlands virtually, which is uh, in the long run a bit frustrating. Uh, so I was, uh, I was very happy to, to, well, to finally here today in Pakistan get the chance to, to do this in person. But I'm of course also very grateful that through all this learning process with online interaction, I, uh, I have the possibility to stay connected with researchers like you somewhere where I'm not at the moment and, um, and keep that interaction going. Uh, yeah, so I'll be talking about uh, catchment hydrology work in, 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 in the region here. Uh, and uh, a lot will be on, on, the, on, on the area where the picture that you see here on the title slide, this is actually the base camp. Um, of, uh, of one of our research sites, it's at uh, exactly 5,000 meters. Uh, so, so this is, you know, when, when I go to the field, which I, for example, do now again in three weeks, uh, we, we stay there in tents uh, for, for three, two, three weeks, and we have all kinds of measurements set up to observe the climate and uh, glaciers and snow uh, and, and, uh, and geology, geomorphology in high mountain Asia. Um, with uh, with a strong science focus, of course, but as Fasl has already mentioned, at, the, at my current employer at EasyMod, uh, we also translate these scientific findings into um, policy relevant uh, work. We advise governments in the region, um, uh, and we contribute to these global assessments, like the IPCC report, for example. Uh, yeah, very briefly, this was now uh, largely mentioned already. My uh, my academic background is, is, is from, from Zurich. So I, I was at ETH, I was working on uh, water in agriculture, groundwater mainly, and then later on the cryosphere um, at ETH in Zurich. Uh, I also did a, a concert diploma in, in, in music that's, that was in Germany with the, uh, Michael Hell, who was the principal cellist at the Munich Philharmonics. Um, and then finally a PhD that I completed last year uh, with, uh, in, in Utrecht in the Netherlands. And my two supervisors are also from very diverse fields. So Walter Imasel is more a surface hydrologist, so looking at large scale water availability in Asia, while Mark Pirkins is a hydrogeologist. So he is looking at global groundwater availability. So I was able to you know, uh, get, uh, um, yeah, get, uh, get a diverse, uh, keep a diverse background in my research, which I try to keep as well. Um, I, I was also working in a consultancy company in, in Switzerland where we did more non-academic work in the water sector. But right now, my, yeah, my, my, my position is a, it's called a glacial hydrologist. Uh, 
encompasses all kinds of uh, hydro hydraulic uh, hydrological work in high mountains at uh, at Isimod. Um, and uh, so 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 Isimod is is uh, is an governmental organization. We are actually covered or carried by all the governments that are linked to high mountain Asian countries. So Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, China, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, and uh, Bangladesh um, are all on our board. Um, they, they own us, so to say, they also finance us. Um, and, 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 and we are providing knowledge to those, um, to those countries uh, by, uh, by advising and bringing them together, trying to solve transboundary challenges in not just in the water field, but also in ecology in, uh, in livelihoods, um, in migration um, that otherwise are, are quite difficult to, to address in this in, 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 the, in, in a politically difficult environment. Um, and we do so, I mean, that's what I list at the bottom, but for me, it's also very important, of course, remain constantly in touch with other research institutes that are outside of the, the region to kind of touch base with uh, what is happening uh, in the different research fields and to transfer that knowledge to the region. I, I call the talk uh, Bridging Gaps because I like to think about, uh, or bridging, yeah, br uh, bridging gaps in science, but then also bridging rivers, because I, I like to think about these scales. So I do a lot of field work, right? I, I, uh, I go to catchments here in, in Nepal and in Pakistan, uh, try to measure hydrological processes. Um, but in the end, we need to upscale this to a larger scale to be able to say something that is relevant for all of Pakistan or all of Afghanistan or all of Nepal. And that's uh, a big challenge, right? How do we make measurements that are done on the field scale useful on a larger scale? And the picture I show here is just also to visualize what our field work looks like. So it's quite common that we have to build our own bridges to cross rivers that otherwise are completely impossible to cross. So that's what my daily you know, job looks like. But I also more recently learned that, um, you know, like in Europe, we, so, so uh, myself, I come from Tyrol in Austria. Uh, so, you know, a very religiously quite a conservative part of Europe. Uh, we have saints for everything, right? Uh, but there are the same you have in South Asia, you have saints for many things. And then I, I, I was very happy to learn that there is a saint in, uh, in the subcontinent for river crossings. So this is Kavacha Kizer who people call to when they need to cross rivers uh, and, and need to get protection. Uh, it's a partly mythological figure, but he's, he's revered from all the way from the Middle East to India. Uh, and this crossing rivers, I have to do quite a lot, but I also have to cross a lot of scales so, uh, while, while doing the research. And that's what I'll be trying to get across today. So this is an excerpt that I, that was one of the subchapter titles in my thesis, uh, which I took from a paper from Günther Plöschl, who is a professor in Vienna, uh, who, who in, yeah, in a very interesting you know, uh, paper where he just mused about uh, hydrology, he said, if you believe there exists a single universal relationship underlying hydrologic processes at many scales, it is hard not to fly off to cloud cuckoo land with this idea. So he's basically saying, don't even, you know, we probably shouldn't try to upscale processes that we observe in the field all the time to the large scale. It's simply, uh, it's, 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 it may often simply be not be possible. But of course, there is so much developing on, on the, you know, on the data, in the data field in geosciences um, that I think we have to be alert all the time. There may be more and more opportunities to actually use large scale data for very, very small scale processes to answer questions on the local scale and to use local scale understanding to validate whatever large scale satellite products we can employ. And to visualize that, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go to a field site that I'm otherwise not going to talk about here in this talk, but I do research in Greenland. And, uh, and uh, so now what you see here, when it zooms out, you see, basically all of Southern Greenland and many, many different layers of satellite imagery over Greenland, right? Uh, going all the way down to imagery that I produce. So you see me standing here with the UAV in my hand. So with a drone in my hand and I'm producing at that very moment when this picture was taken. So I'm, I'm, I took a selfie basically. I was producing a very, very high resolution surface map of this very small part of Greenland. And we did this for a paper that was published uh, at the end of last year where we try to show that we can map 
the surface roughness of the ice, which is a very specific parameters of studies we have in glaciology, we can map that with, uh, with a UAV at a centimeter resolution, but we can also see it from a very new satellite called ISAT from space. And this is the plot on the left, which I'm not gonna go into detail, but we were basically comparing these UAV measurements to, uh, to, to measurements taken from space. And this is possible because we, we have so many scales of data at the moment in, uh, coming from, from all kinds of satellites. And, and this data also becomes more and more interesting for snow, which is something that uh, we don't have an ice sheet in, in high mountain Asia, but we have a lot of snow. And because with these high resolution products from, from drones, uh, we can actually create very accurate maps um, of snow uh, in, in the region. We're already doing this for glaciers. But this is really a frontier of our research, right? Using these relatively affordable um, yeah, devices that you can buy by now in nearly every supermarket in, in, in Germany. When I talk about scale in hydrology, I, it gets a lot more complex because it's not just an image, right? So this is a map from of high mountain Asia in the very, let me quickly pull up the laser pointer here. Um, so uh, over here, we have the Kabul Basin. So this is Afghanistan, basically, going over the Karakoram, Pakistan, Western Himalaya, India, Nepal, Central Himalaya, to Eastern Himalaya in Bhutan, um, and then finally the Tibetan Plateau. Um, so this is the this is the mountain range that we refer to as Hindu Kush Himalaya (HKH). And what is plotted here are the major rivers. Right? The, the, the width of these of these lines of these colorful lines is the total discharge. What you see down here, so the total mean annual discharge. And the color is the contribution of the total flow that comes from different sources. For the first panel. It shows you the, the relative contribution of glacier melt. So how much of the water is actually coming from glaciers. And you can see that for the upper stream, the upper part of the Indus, so the, um, the Indus River, a very large fraction comes from glacier melt. Right? So this means that glaciers in the Indus, they matter a lot. While if I do the same for Nepal, so we are here in the central upper, central Himalaya, um, Himalaya so the upper Ganges, Glaciers play a very small role because the hydrological budget is driven mainly by the monsoon. Uh, so this helps us to focus our research questions as well, right? Now, the second panel is the relative contribution of snow. And what is very striking here, of course, is the Kabul River Basin, which is this part here, right? That is very, very dependent on snow melt. Um, it's much less dependent on glacier melt because the glaciers in that basin are actually relatively small. Uh, and you can see some of the streams that are also more dependent on, on, on snow melt. Um, but the, the upper Karakoram, for example, where it's very, very cold most of the time, so snow melt never happens, is, doesn't, it doesn't matter so much for snow. And then finally, the last panel is the, is the dependence on liquid precipitation, rainfall. And there you can see that all the lower rivers that directly drain into the Ganges, uh, so all the rivers that are in Nepal are heavily dependent on rain. And, and, and this is important for us for research, but also for communication to, to governments, of course, that, you know, in Nepal, for example, it matters mainly with, we have to know more about rain. We have to know more about how rain is acting in, in you know, how it's distributing in the, in the region. While for Afghanistan, we really have to keep investing in snow because it is so dependent. Um, discharge is so dependent on, on that part of the river. Um, and now the question is, you know, how do we, this is a large scale model, right? So it has a lot of uncertainties and we want to go back to our field scale and try to understand, is this really what we see in the field? And what can we do to improve those large scale models? Because they ignore a lot of processes um, on the local scale. And that's what we are trying to do. And, but here, what I, what I show is, is, a, is a global map of a recent special issue in the journal, well, in hydrological processes, where many, many scientists who do uh, hydrological research in, on the catchment scale, they contributed their data and their insights, right? So we tried to map um, where do we actually know something about catchments and catchment science. Um, and you can see there's a very, very strong a very you know, high density in Central Europe, of course, in, in the Eastern US. But for the HKH, for Asia, it's hardly anything. This doesn't mean that there are no catchments, but 
those catchments that exist, they do not report any data. So they are not accessible, right? To us as the research community, they are basically not there. They, we may know that they, they do exist. Some researcher may sit on the data, um, but the data is either not accessible or it has never been, um, it has never been stored in a way that is, that is usable for others. And that's really a huge, you know, that, that is a huge gap. Um, we can also see that, 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 that apparently, you know, here Russia hasn't been doing very well and probably is, is, it's going to be very, very challenging in future as well, given the political circumstances. But because climate is so different in the HKH, right? We are, we are, we are talking here about mountains that are up to 8,000 meters high. So anything related to hydrology is also very different than in the Alps. It's quite crucial that whatever model, whatever process understanding we develop in the Alps, we would also want to check whether that is true in Asia, where so many, many more people are dependent on the resource of water. Um, so yeah, that, that, that has been a call for many years that we need more observations in, in the region. We are trying to cover at least some of that. And not just ourselves, but also in networking with other researchers in the region to, to learn from each other and connect the knowledge in different uh, catchments in the region. Uh, also, make it you know it's very important that this is not research that is driven by, by 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 researchers in Europe who say you have to do this, but this to a large degree also has to be carried, of course, regionally. And the scientists with the right quality, they are there. That is not uh, that is not a problem. So if, uh, the the two research catchments that that I focus on um, in this talk. Uh, and, or actually at the work that we do in, at ECMOD and my employer are, are both in the central Himalaya. Um, and, and I'll mainly focus on the one here in Langtang. Uh, they are, uh, so, so they're both on the Indian, Nepali Indian border. So they just border towards the, the, the province of Tibet in, in China. Uh, they, they, they both reach from about 4,500 to uh, 7,000 meters. Uh, Mustang actually has Taulagiri, so one of the 8,000 is just next to it. Uh, Langtang Valley has Shishapangma, which is also 8,000 meters high, or more than 8,000 meters. So we are really at the part of the Himalaya where we are going from the plains to the highest points on the planet. I, this is a, perhaps a bit of a complex figure, but I just wanted to show you also that even though this is in the central Himalaya, the climate is very diverse on a very small area, right? And I just want to focus you on uh, focus on this on this subplot here. So we have uh, Yala, which is Langtang, this Langtang Valley, the Yala Glacier is there, um, and the Rikasamba is in the Mustang Valley. They are 200 kilometers apart. And in the background here, you see the, the isohypsis, so the, you know, uh, uh, the, the mean annual rainfall. You can see that the Mustang Valley is already much, much, much drier than where we are with the Langtang Valley. Because the Langtang is just a little bit further south, so it gets a lot more of the monsoon. So we have two catchments relatively close to each other that are impacted very differently by, by the South, south Asian climate. And of course, for us as scientists, that makes it very exciting because we can test different hypotheses in different environments. And we do all this by keeping in mind that we also want to do it together with the local government. We are training local scientists, uh, so government scientists, um, on how to do the monitoring and these kind of things. Uh, the, the catchment that I'll focus on, just to give you an idea what our, you know, what does our work, um, so, so long-term monitoring work look like in the Himalaya. Uh, it has been, research has been going on here since the 1970s. And that's simply because, um, so well, to, 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 to do a very long excursion into German history as well, uh, where Heinrich Harra in his seven years in, in mythical seven years in Tibet, he actually, um, he passed by in the valley of the backside here. Uh, so this was always the border between the British empire and the Tibetan empire until the Tibet was taken over by China. Um, and when they were, uh, when, when, when um, Heinrich Khan, I forget the, his colleague's name. Anyway, when these two guys, when they came back from China, they crossed the border over here. Um, so, you know, this, this is, uh, yeah, it's, it's also politically an interesting area. Um, but because it's, uh, many of those, uh, those valleys were not accessible to foreign researchers because it was politically quite sensitive. And Langtang, for some reason, 
has always been rel relatively easy. So very early foreigners could go in. And then in the 1970s, the Japanese already started to build first research stations. That's why we have data since the 1970s, which is really quite, you know, it's, it's, it's quite an impressive time period for, for, for the region. And then the Swiss government came in the 1990s uh, to, to, to set up uh, at least discharge measurements every day. And since 2012, in a collaboration between uh, my local employer, the Utrecht University in the Netherlands, the Norwegian government and the at ETH in, in Switzerland, as well as the Department for Hydrology and Meteorology in Nepal, we have been monitoring climate and the cryosphere um, and, and hydrology in the catchment continuously. Continuously means we have many, many different weather stations in here. We measure discharge, uh, we observe hazards, uh, we, we measure the change of glaciers and report this to the um, Global Monitoring Service for Glaciers, which uses this data then to calibrate global glacier change models. Um, and uh, some of the data is also directly made public via internet, uh, so via the satellite. Link. The catchment is quite diverse. It starts at 1,200 meters. Right? So this is the lower part here. Uh, this is looking up the valley. Uh, you have to drive about seven to 10 hours for, uh, for distance of about 80 kilometers. That's how bad the road is. It's the main road between Nepal and China at the moment. Um, well, at the moment, the border is still closed because of COVID. But, um, so we drive to the last village where the road stops and then we have to walk for, th for three days until we reach uh, our, the last village in the valley. There is no road. Um, so we start at the point where people grow vegetables next to the river where monkeys live and all kinds of, you know, it's basically a jungle. And we end up in, so this is me sitting in front of one of the 7,000 that's there. We end up in, uh, in the classical high mountain alpine environment. And this is what my night normally looks like. Uh, there's a lot of snowfall, it's, 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 uh, it's extremely cold. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, the, the, the working conditions, especially in the autumn season, so in October, November, it can be quite tough. So it's, it's normal to, to have minus 15 degrees at night, which basically means that, uh, you know, we, uh, yeah, we, I, I take two bottles uh, of uh, hot water into my sleeping bag. I, I do not take off my clothes for two weeks straight. Uh, and I sleep with the warm bottles in the sleeping bag, and, uh, and they are still completely, sometimes they're even frozen in the morning. Uh, when I started this work, I was in my late, what is it now? Yeah, my late 20s. I could still sleep the whole night. By now, I'm 35. I wake up at 2 in the morning and I don't fall asleep anymore at this temperature. And it's getting a little bit less comfortable. But for, yeah, this is. Uh, it, for, for those, I don't know, for those of you who are doing high mountain mountaineering, this, this, is, quite, uh, this is quite normal. I, this is what our weather stations look like. So we, uh, we monitor precipitation in what we call pluviometers. Um, this sounds scientific, but basically it's just a bucket uh, that has a scale mounted to the bottom of it. And it measures the weight of the bucket every 15 minutes. Uh, it has a sensor that measures the snow depth if there is any snow and then a couple of other climatic variables. Uh, this, is, this is our highest station at uh, 5,600 meters, uh, 5,700 meters. Um, oh, sorry, no, just before, sort of, yeah, yeah, some of this. And uh, this is a uh, uh, standard weather station that doesn't, does, uh, isn't focused on precipitation, but it's more focused on snow. Um, there is, a, again, a snow sensor. There is another a sensor here, which actually measures the water content of snow. And this is really a field that we have to get more into because so far when we measure snow, we only measure if there is snow or not, but we don't measure how much water there is actually in snow. And the density of snow can change quite a lot in time and in space. And uh, this has been done for a couple of years in Europe now, but even there, the sensors are not so, uh, they're, they're quite expensive and it's quite difficult to, to maintain them. Um, but we're quite happy to have, uh, to have two of them running in the catchment now, so we can get a bit of an idea of how much, how much water resource there is actually in the snowpack. And then finally, the, probably the, the most difficult to upkeep long, in the long run is measuring discharge in these very mobile rivers. Um, so we basically just have a pressure transducer in the river that gives us a pressure level every 15 minutes. 
and uh, then we have to create so-called rating curves to, to get the actual volume of water. But these rivers, they are classical alpine rivers like you would have in, 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 in the Alps as well. Uh, they move a lot. There's a lot of sediment that, that destroys the stations constantly. So it's very, very challenging to keep those running and also very challenging to get accurate measurements from this kind of data. So this is what the longest time series looks like at one station. So we measure the height of the water level. And you can see, so this is started in 1993. And this started in a way like it's still done in many locations in high mountain Asia manually. So for, um, for about uh, 20 years, they had an employee who lived in that village and he had to go to the stage meter every day at exactly eight o'clock, no, exactly six o'clock in the afternoon or in the evening and read off the stage reading at that point, note it down, and then it is was collected in a notebook and then transferred to the capital. Um, and they diligently did this for 20 years. Uh, but of course, this is only one measurement per day. Uh, since uh, 2012, we measure per hour. Uh, but uh, what I'm trying to tell people here as well, just because this is just daily data, you know, this, there's a lot of value in that as well, because it's a long time series. And what we are currently trying to do is to show what kind of signal we can see in this daily data. Right? It's rather than throwing it out and saying, oh, this is just measured once a day. There is value in this. And there is also um, more and more appreciation in Europe, actually, that, you know, data sets that have been collected, or the, I think the most impressive one in, in, in Europe, and I think the oldest time series is in Luxembourg, actually, where monks have been recording temperature in vineyards since centuries, right? And they did not do it to write papers, obviously. They wrote it because they were interested in it, but now we can make use of this data. This is a lot more impressive than the time series I'm showing you here. But I think we, we really have to go back to all these old, slightly less scientific data and make use of it. Because if we want to see how climate has been changing over a long period of time, um, then, then, then we have to realize that long time series data is, is, is essential. And often, yeah, there is a lot of use in them, actually. It's just a lot of work to put it into a format that is, is helpful. So. And what I'm trying to get from this data then is basically uh, is, uh, is to try to find patterns. So this is what I'm calling bridging the gap. So here you see time series of discharge from three different locations. So there are like three subcatchments. The black one is the biggest one, and then there are smaller areas of the catchment where we also measured for shorter periods of time, so the red and the green curve. But you can already see, you know, sketchy data, there were issues with the sensor in between, there was a huge earthquake in 2015, which destroyed all our settings, uh, setups in the, up, in the lower part. Um, uh, so it's, 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 not that, it's not that easy to read something into this data. Uh, but if I standardize this now per area, I can already see that for different catchments, we so this is the mean uh, runoff uh, over the year, so from January to December, and that even for two catchments, so the red and the green one, they are they are not connected to each other. They have similar patterns in discharge going up. So you can see similar peaks at, uh, uh, happening here. And you can also see that the small catchments are rising earlier. This is because, uh, so there's a lot of melt happening in spring um, and into early summer. Uh, and that water is flowing down out of that catchment, but it doesn't seem to reach the outlet of the big catchment, right? Which means that the water, because this is standardized against area, so that ideally those lines should all be on the same, the same volume. But what is happening here is that this discharge from the small catchments, it actually goes into the subsurface. It's being stored in the ground. And on only later in the year, actually, the, the value is getting higher here for the, for the outlets, for the big black catchment. Um, so water does not, once it's created from melt or from rain, it does not immediately leave the catchment. And this is, as hydrologists, we try to understand and document such processes because it helps us to further improve the hydrological models that we have. Um, and this is important for forecasting. This is important for hydropower to understand when is water available rather than just saying, okay, it rains, so there's going to be water. In the now, a challenging part, and I'm going to yeah, I, I'm going to talk about this for a bit. But yeah, time-wise, we should be fine. Um, monitoring snow is essential, and uh, we have been, you know, doing okay with uh, with mapping coverage and the persistence of snow, also in high mountain Asia. 
um, so that we know relatively well, right? So we have uh, different satellite products that we can employ to see where there is snow and where there's no snow. They are not perfect, but uh, we are able to do this on a very large scale. Snow depth is a bit more challenging. So we could say we know somewhat in the large scale, right? We can measure that on a point with the weather station. But, and I was discussing this just before I, we started the talk, there is you know, new satellite data, Sentinel-1, uh, uh, which is you know, financed by, uh, by, by Germany. Actually, it's the European Space Agency. Uh, and they have the, the technical headquarters um, is, uh, is just is on the, I think on the, on the Starnberger say, um, but anyway, it's, in, uh, in, in, yeah, it's based in Germany. And, that set satellite has been running since 2016. And uh, what you see here are, are lines of snow depth for different stations. And the one from Hindu Kush Himalaya is the one that we supplied. Um, and you can see the, the, those two lines. So the one that is re retrieved from space compared against the station data is doing a pretty impressive job for weekly snow data. So we are now actually able for any spot on the globe to see how deep snow is. Which is thinking of considering that that's a satellite that's pretty impressive. But the big challenge is, uh, is snow water equivalent, right? So how much water is actually in that snowpack? And here I just show you the station that where we measure snow water equivalent and also you know, how variable the snowpack looks like, right? So this is a classic, this is a time-lapse camera that measures you know, what the, the melt process was, is looking like. And it's not melting from one day to the other, it's melting in a very, very patchy fashion. And, uh, and, and, and determining you know, what, what the snow state here is actually at this one point, it may be different than, than, uh, than a little bit, you know, here it's different than, than somewhere a bit further to the left or the right. And on a larger scale, that's true as well. So we, you know, um, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, coarse imagery, so this is going to be fine, this situation, because it's everywhere snow. So satellite is gonna tell me it's snow. But actually, during the melting season, snow cover also in the Alps looks like this, right? And catching this on satellite imagery is quite challenging because the resolution of our satellites is still is simply not um, it's not good enough. And yeah, we are we are talking about 500 meters to 90 meters. But in the last couple of years, we have been moving towards uh, um, higher resolution private providers of satellite imagery, uh, which uh, is opening a lot of opportunity to actually look at much smaller processes as well. Um, just fast, correct me, but now we are at half an hour, right? So uh, if I talk for another 10 minutes and then we'll have, we'll have uh, time to discuss, is that fine? Or five, yeah, five think, minutes? Yeah, I think it's fine, yeah. Perfect. Because then, then I'll end uh, with uh, a very specific topic in, in glaciology that has received attention only in the last couple, or well, the last decade perhaps or so. So we know that these kind of debris covered glaciers exist. They exist in the Alps, um, but they are especially common in the Himalaya. So, uh, and, and that's something that I focused on during my PhD thesis as well. So debris covered glaciers are basically glaciers that on the lower part of their tongue um, are covered in rocks. And that rock cover can be up to two, three meters deep, uh, right? So that means uh, that, that ice is protected from, from melt because the energy cannot, uh, it, it takes much longer uh, for, for the energy to tramp, to, to, to go through that debris, to, to, to that rock cover, and a lot of energy is lost in, in the rocks before it can actually reach the ice. So in a way, glaciers are protecting themselves from being destroyed. Uh, debris cover is growing all over the planet as glaciers are receding, so they are kind of digging themselves in. Um, and this is a very complex phenomenon because then, then lakes form on this debris cover. That's when it melts more again. And there are many, many glaciological processes that are complex. But just here as an overview, yeah, so in, in um, globally, it's about 10 to 20% of all ice on the globe is actually covered in rocks. In the HKH, it's, about, it's, it's, it's more like a third. And uh, it's a, a third for, for, for the volume um, because especially the lower parts of glaciers are covered in rocks and the lower parts are also much thicker. So relatively speaking, a, a bigger part of the ice volume is covered. In. And we still don't know that much about how that affects the hydrology and catchments that are very dominated by ice. And just to give you an idea what that looks like, so these are two glaciers in the catchment that I work in. And uh, so here you see a debris covered glacier. It's really 
but the people, when they first time they see them, they find this very unimpressive because it's basically just a huge pile of rocks. Uh, while this is the, the classical glacier that we work on in clean ice, right? So this is, uh, this is our typical field work. We have to cross those glaciers to measure. Um, but these two types of glaciers, they react very, very differently to climate. And what we are basically doing is, um, so here you see again a time series over a couple of years, the blue line is the same discharge data I showed you before. We are now able to compute the melt that is created from these different glaciers. And we are trying to understand how that is impacting the hydrology in the area. Now, specifically what is interesting with the debris cover is that it is peaking much later in the day because the energy takes longer to reach the ice. So what you see here are yeah, diurnal curves with discharge. So just the mean of uh, discharge over the day, right? And this is the, the mean for all the months. So we'll just focus on this graph here. And what you can see is, so the blue line is the total discharge in the catchment that we measure. The red line is the total discharge from clean ice glaciers. And the, the gray line is the ones from the recover glaciers. You can already see that the recover glaciers are less in that catchment, so it's also less discharge, but it peaks much later during the day. So that eventually also explains why we can see two peaks, probably why we can see two peaks in the discharge, especially here. And then during February, March, April, there are two peaks in discharge because those glaciers produce melt at a different point in time. And again, that's a process that, you know, uh, that, that is for us is important to understand when we run hydrological models that are trying to resolve all processes in a catchment scale. And it's something that we still don't know very much about to actually reproduce the models. And then to, uh, yeah, to, to finish it off, what we are trying to, you know, when we look at snow, we look at glaciers, we also measuring soil moisture and precipitation, of course. So we are trying to link all these data to understand how, what the catchment as, as, a, as, a home, as, a, as an organism, so to say, is doing while it's being fed with material, with water at the top and it's releasing water at the bottom. And here I just give you a snapshot of, uh, of different sensors that we have in, in installed in our catchment over, over about four months. Um, in in uh, 2018, I think. And uh, they, they are located at different elevations, so they're not directly comparable, but a lot of processes we can, we can, we can follow through all the variables here. So just briefly, the, at the bottom, the blue is the precipitation, right? So you hear precipitation in millimeters per, um, per hour. Uh, in black, you have the snow depth. So you can see that in May, there is still half a meter of snow. Sometimes there's snowfall events. It goes up for a meter and immediately disappears again because it's blown away by wind. In red, we have the air temperature. So you can see that the air temperature slowly, slowly in June is going above zero degrees. And then in mid, to, mid of June, it's staying above zero degrees. So the vertical line is zero degree line. And then in the top plot, in black, we have the discharge at the end of the catchment. So you can see that until mid-May, there is very, very little discharge happening. And, and, and then it suddenly starts to, to rise quite quickly. And then in blue, you have the soil moisture, how much water is stored in the soil moisture. Now, because those two sensors are located a little bit further down, I have to shift them a bit to make it directly comparable. But basically what you can see in these plots is as the snow, it's staying, um, it's, uh, it's, it's staying at the same level until mid-May. But as it's melting, the water is not going directly into the river. It's going first into the soil moisture, right? So the snow melt is actually infiltrating into the ground. It's filling up the ground, nearly fully saturation to full saturation. So 30% of the ground is here. So we have here cubic meters per cubic meters of water. That's the unit. And for you know, a whole month, that whole water of snow melt goes into the ground. It stays there. And only then, after these three, four weeks, it is released from the ground and it goes into discharge. That means if we would not have considered soil moisture, we would have predicted that, uh, that the water goes directly into the river, right? Which is an oversimplification and, and, uh, and, and, and it makes us predict water in the river much earlier than it actually happens. And this is something we cannot see with remote sensing. And it's very difficult to resolve with large scale models. And so this is why we need to go to small catchments and try to understand these processes to then take it further into large scale models. But to, uh, you know, to ask the question, so what, what all that for? Just very briefly to sum it up and to also make one last link to one um, in the next slide. Uh, 
the change of timing and volume in discharge is important for hydropower. So that's, that's the countries here are extremely dependent on hydropower for ecosystems and agriculture. And especially now with the newest IPCC report, you know, the term cascading hazards and compound events have become very popular because we see this more and more, right? We see ha hazard chains rather than just one single avalanche. Now we see a, a, a permafrost thawing that results in um, that uh, results in a rockfall, that results in a debris flow. So many hazards that are linked together. And, and this becomes more and more complicated for us to untangle with the data that we have. But we need a lot of data and documentation to do this. And especially for ecology, and this is where then I'll, 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 I'll move towards, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully a discussion. Uh, a researcher who is actually from Bonn and who is now in Utrecht, she's been looking at uh, how plants are taking over the area that has been vacated by glaciers. Um, they're doing this mainly in Switzerland. So they're looking at what happened to the area where previously there were glaciers. And we are now together, we are also trying to do this in the Himalaya. Um, so here the line you see is the, the extent of the glacier in this case in the last ice age, um, right? And then in, in green is the extent in 1980, in, uh, in, in red, I hope you can see it is the extent in 2010. And then in white is basically an image from 2019. Right? This is how much this glacier has been receding over the last decades, so quite significantly. But now what we want to understand is what is happening to the ground where this ice has disappeared. Right? And uh, one hypothesis is that the rain that falls on that ground, you know, there's more. Uh, it will be it will be more rapid the runoff because previously it was falling as snow on the glacier. It was staying as ice and only was released many years later. Now there is no more glacier, it will fall as rain, so it will immediately go into discharge, which means much more floods, uh, much more rapid high discharge. But we don't know whether that's actually true. Uh, uh, then one question is for sediment, you know, is the deglacierized area, um, uh, sorry, yeah, discharge more, so di is, uh, create discharge more sediment, so, because it's immobile moraine material, um, what is happening here? Are we, are we going to see more fine sediments in our rivers, which has a huge impact on hydropower, also a huge impact on agriculture? We simply don't know. Um, so this is, you know, th this is something that we are hoping to get into in, in, in future, and where actually ecologists, botanists, glaciologists, and hydrologists have to kind of link everything together um, to look, look into this in, in, in detail. Um, and so I have a couple of more slides on, on mapping regional hazards, which we are also doing, but I'll stop here to have some time for, for discussion. I'm happy to explain that as well, but this is basically just our work. We're trying to map uh, debris flows and, uh, and glacial lake outburst floods in the area, uh, because this is uh, something that has definitely been uh, a huge, a huge problem in the HKH. Um, also in Afghanistan, so this is a case that we've been monitoring closely in the Panjshir Valley, uh, which created, actually killed quite a lot of people in 2018 and happened again last year, where we have these big flood events that are created during high snow melt events and, uh, and changes in glaciers, but where many, many different drivers come together. And uh, it's just very complex to, to predict it and understand this, this well. And th this is why we are trying yeah, keep monitoring in the area and, uh, and, and link it all together to make sure that, uh, that assessments in future are there for governments to make sense of.